Thank you for joining me today. My name is Lori. I'm a nurse. I work with Orbis. Um, infection control is a, a specialty of mine. So today we're going to be talking about uh, instrumentation, sterilization, um, and all about the star processing um, departments. So we have some objectives today. We're going to talk about the environment of which your star processing department is in. We're going to talk about quality control and how you test your equipment. We'll be going into the cleaning and decontamination process. And then we're going to start talking about sterilization, all the different methods that we mostly see in ophthalmology. And then we'll talk about storage or return to the sterile field, sterilizing your instruments and bringing them right back into the operating room. All right, so let's, let's get into this. So let's talk about the environment of which your sterilization department is in. And please forgive my my 110 pound uh, photo bomb behind me. <laughs> um, central processing really should be divided into a minimum of two, but ideally three areas. Now, I know it's not easy. Um, we don't have a lot of space, especially in ambulatory surgery centers, but if you can somehow separate them, even if it's in one big room, you kind of want to separate your areas. So you, one area for decontamination, those are your dirty instruments. Those are the instruments that are, you know, coming in from the operating rooms. These are contaminated instruments. Then you have one area for packaging, for inspecting, putting, you know, your instruments in their packages or putting instruments um, inside their sets, kind of putting everything together. These are your non-sterile. And then you have your sterilization area. This is where you have your sterilizers. These are going to be your clean. We're going to be putting them in and take them out sterile. Um, key is for that sterilization area really should be um, control temperature up to 75 degrees, which is 24 Celsius, humidity 30 to 60 percent, and your sterile storage area really shouldn't exceed 70 percent. Now, many of us have number one and number two in one area and number three in another, and that's okay. Um, if if you don't have separate rooms, sort of separate your room um, by sections. So in other words, if you look below, you can see that one area. Your dirty goes in one way, and then your clean comes out the other way. If you can have two separate entrances and exit, that is, that's wonderful. Whereas you're bringing dirty instruments from your operating theater in one way, and then when you bring in clean instruments out, you're bringing them out another way. You really don't want to be passing clean and dirty. So if you don't have a, a barrier, so to speak, a wall between your clean and dirty, at least if you can somehow separate them into two separate areas so that your dirty is going in one way and your clean is going in another. So we're going to go into uh, quality control because these are things you should be doing before you start your day. So you know that your sterilizers are working properly. So bug, these are basically bug tests. This is what we call them. These are biological tests. You can see by the bottom, that's just one example of one. Um, they assess the sterilization process directly by killing these highly resistant microorganisms. Okay? They come in these little self-contained um, vials. They're self-contained spores inside of a vial, and it's with a, a sealed growth medium. So basically what you do is you're going to put in the sterilizer. You're going to expose the biological to a sterilization process, then when it's done, you're going to activate it. Honestly, I, you know, most of them, you just push the top and then you squeeze it. Um, some of them give you a little device to do that. Either way, you want to crush the ampule. And then what that's going to do is it's going to activate it. It's going to allow the growth medium to create this growth environment for the bug. And now you're going to incubate it. You're going to put it in an incubator. Okay. Now, some incubators, some processes allow for this bug test to give you a result in 15, 20 minutes, you know, and you can do it the morning of. Others take 24 hours, and that's okay too. But so basically, your incubation produces these um, acid byproducts, and that causes the medium to change color. So the spores that were exposed to the sterilization process are killed. So they can't produce that acid. So there's no color change. But you always want to make sure that you're doing a control, which is basically a bug that didn't go in the sterilizer, did not get sterilized, but still get activated. So the bug that was not sterilized, you still activate it, you still crush it, you incubate it, and those will change color, okay? Um, because the sterilization, there was no sterilization process that killed the bug. But you want to use a control because you need something to compare it to. 
You can't look at a bug and say, okay, that's great, that's negative, if you don't have a positive to compare it to. So you always want to use a control. And again, there are different incubators. There are different bug tests that you can use. Some are for 24 hours, which is fine. Some are for um, you know, an hour, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It really just depends. Sometimes they come in um, the little packs that give you a biological and a chemical together. They come in all different ways. The key is to be sure that you are doing this because this is the way to tell that your sterilizer is working. This is quality control. So chemical monitoring are those little strips. Now, chemical indicators or indicator strips, what they do is they react to change in the physical conditions in the sterilizer. So it's treated paper. And that treated paper changes color when it's exposed to certain sterilization parameters. So what it's doing is it's checking on the cycle length, the cycle temperature, and exposure. These are just some examples. You can see the one above. That's a type 1. Um, and we'll go into that later, but you know, you want to make sure that that uh, line changes color. The one on the bottom is another example. That's a class five, and you want to make sure that the color goes past that white. You can see reject and accept, and that your blue, um, that blue uh, line goes past a certain spot. These are just some examples, and they come as different types, and we're going to talk about that. So you want to be sure that you're using the right type for the right sterilization process. So here are those types. Now, the classification structure is really only used to describe the characteristics and intended use of that particular indicator. The, the class number doesn't mean that one class is better than another, just each one of these has a very specific role. So this just gives you an idea. Class one was the one I showed you above. That's just a process indicator. Really what that's telling you is that the instruments went through a process. It's not telling you that it went through the right length of time, um, had the right parameters. All it's telling you is that it went through a steam sterilization process. So, you know, I've heard people say you could take these and hold it over a, you know, boiling pot of water with that hot steam and it will change color. That's really what it's intended use is to. So it's going to differentiate process items from uncrossed. In other words, if you open a sterilizer and that class one is on the outside of a um, you know, outside of the package, you can look and automatically know that it went through a process. Example, some people, you know, they may open the sterilizer and then they get called away. So they don't bring the instruments out. They stay in. So you can come and you can see, okay, these, are, these have gone through a process. Or it can happen that some people will put dirty instruments in to the sterilizer to be sterilized but then they get called away. They haven't closed the door. They haven't started the process. Somebody else comes along. They think they're sterile, but they know, they're going to know they're not sterile because they're going to see that that class one indicator is showing them the color hasn't changed and it hasn't gone through a process. That's all the color one, number one does. Uh, class two will go into, and then you got class three through class six. And basically the rest of them, what they are is that they're reacting to, you know, one, two, three different indicators. Typically in ASCs, typically in um, in most you know uh, sterile processing areas, we use a class five. So what a class five does, it's an integrating indicator. It reacts to all the critical variables, time, temperature, everything. All right, it really is the most accurate of the um, indicators because it, it really correlates to a biological. It's as close as you're going to get to a biological bug. Now, what's important to know is that you have to use these inside every pack, every peel pouch, every container. So if you have, let's say a rigid container, we'll talk about that later, and you've got instruments inside the rigid container, that class five indicator needs to go all the way into the absolute bottom level of your, um, what's inside that container. So in every case, in every package, in every instrument tray. If you've got three instrument trays inside of a container, they're going to go in all three because you need to know that the steam penetrated all the way through. If you just throw it in the container, all it's telling you is it went through one layer. It's not telling you it went all the way down to the other layer. So you want to be sure that you're using a class five in every single container. So example, five and six. See the picture on top. It's a double layer tray. So if when you're using a double layer tray, you're going to make sure that that indicator not only is on top, but on the bottom, because otherwise you don't know that the steam penetrated all the way through. OK, so it's meeting all the critical variables of the sterilization process, your temperature, time and 
um, complete replacement of air with steam. So the determining factor in steam sterilization is ensuring penetration, that steam got through all the way to where it needs to go. So that's why you need to place it in all containers and packages at the absolute bottom to be sure that it has steam has penetrated all the way through. Now, type two is what's called the Bowie Dick test. And this test is specific for sterilizers that use pre-vacuum, okay? Because basically with the type twos, what you're doing is you're evaluating the sterilization's performance. You're not testing whether or not instruments are sterile. What you're doing is you're testing the performance of a pre-vac cycle. Pre-vac cycles require a vacuum to be drawn during like the first, first and last phases of the, of the cycle. So you've got to be sure that that's working correctly, that those that vacuum is going to vacuum out everything it needs to. Basically what it's doing is it's replacing, um, replacing the uh, air inside of the chamber and it's pushing it out, all right? It's vacuuming it out. That's what makes actually pre-vac a very good sterilization um, method because it's sucking all the air out of everything, out of your cannulas, out of everything. But it does that through pulses. It does that through a vacuum. And you got to make sure that that's working properly. So this gives you an idea of a Bowie Dick test. On the left, you'll see it's an unprocessed one. In the middle, you see everything's uniform. All those lines look beautiful. And then on, on the last one, you can see it failed because you know, you've got that blot in the middle, or it could show the lines might be squiggly. So this gives you an indication of a Bowie Dick test. That's a type two. So indicator testing really should be performed daily. If you can't do it daily, at least minimum weekly. Okay, you wanna be sure that you're doing it at least weekly. Um, but if you can, every day is perfect. Um, and during critical assessments. So what a critical assessment is, is either uh, you installed a new sterilizer, you relocated your sterilizer um, after a malfunction or, and, or failure or after any major repairs. When any of these happen, you need to do um, indicator testing. You really shouldn't put it back into use until you know that everything's working properly. So typically there's a sequence of how you do that. So it should be three consecutive empty steam cycles, should be run with a biological and a chemical in every appropriate you know, test package or tray, but you know, and an empty steam cycle, meaning you're not doing it with instruments. If you want to just put an empty tray in there and you know, put a, a indicator in there, that's fine. And then three consecutive empty cycles are run with the Bowie Dick test if you have a pre-vac sterilizer. So if you have a sterilizer that does both pre-vac and gravity displacement, you want to be sure that you're doing your um, testing on underneath both those, uh, those cycles. The sterilizer really shouldn't be put back into use until all indicators show that it's negative. So be sure that if you have any critical assessments, uh, you had to have repairs done via sterilizer, you had to move them, anything like that, that you're not just you know, saying, okay, it's all set, it's good to go and putting it back into use. You've got to test them, all right? Do your three consecutive cycles with your indicators. Do your Bowie dictate test if you have a pre-vac sterilizer. Get your testing done to be 100% sure that um, everything is fine and document it. We'll go into documentation later. Now you've got mechanical monitoring, and these are important too. So these are tools that validate the autoclave process. Okay, these, this gives you that real-time evaluation of the sterilization process, and um, it really it results in a permanent record. So this can be your printouts and your charts or gauges, and what it's doing is measuring the time, temperature, and pressure. Okay, your sterilizers really should have something to give you, whether it's a printout, whether it's a gauge, to show you real time to show you that that process that you're taking out those instruments, that instrument process met the correct time for sterilization, the correct temperature, the correct pressure in a real time scenario. So you need something to show you when you before you take out those instruments that it met the correct parameters. All right, decontamination, cleaning your instruments. These instruments come out no longer. Do we have the days of taking instruments out of the operating room and putting them right into the sterilizer and not going through a decontamination process? Those days are done. We've got to be sure that all your instruments are coming out and getting cleaned and decontaminated properly. All right, and it really should begin as soon as the instruments reach the decontamination area. You can also start decontaminating your instruments at the end of the surgical procedure. Start doing it as soon as possible or when the surgery is almost near done. 
you know, if you're a scrub and you're working with your surgeon and you're doing, uh, let's say, a, a cataract procedure at the end of the case, they're hydrating the wound, you can be there, you know, cleaning your instruments. The purpose of that is so things don't dry on your instruments, so that you're not getting um, viscoelastic stuck to your instruments or cannulas aren't getting clogged. So, you know, as you're going along in the procedures, you know, the doctor gives you back an instrument if they don't need you right away, or even maybe as they're taking the cataract out, you're cleaning your instruments. So cleaning and rinsing really are the first and most important steps in decontamination. As mentioned, lens matter, you've got nucleus inside of your cannulas, viscoelastic can harden and it can permanently block your, your cannulas and those are gonna end, end up in the garbage if you're using reusable cannulas. Um, saline salt crystals, they're terrible for instruments. Um, it can cause pitting, um, blood and body fluids. It can cause de deterioration of the, of the surface of the instruments and it's really hard to remove. You've got organic material, blood, soil, debris, all these things, what they're gonna do is if you don't clean them and they stay on the instruments, and those instruments go in the sterilizer and get sterilized, the heat, the sterilization process is going to stick that matter, that um, debris onto the instrument, onto the surface. And then, then what that's going to do is preventing the sterilization process, is preventing the sterilization agent from actually penetrating and reaching the instrument because now it's blocked by viscoelastic stuck on the instrument or you know, pieces of the cataract nucleus stuck on the instrument, soil, um, organic material, blood, that blood is preventing the agent, whether it's steam, gas, what have you, it's going to prevent it from reaching the actual instrument. So you're basically blocking it from getting sterilized. You got to do, you got to do contamination immediately. So like I mentioned, start on your back table, begin right away during the procedure, prevent that drying of blood. How are you going to do this? How do you know how best to clean and decontaminate, decontaminate your instruments? You got to use the instructions for use. This is your IFUs. These are your manufacturer's instructions for use. Every instrument, when you get them, when they come, they're going to come with this little piece of paper or something inside that's going to tell you exactly how you need to clean that instrument. It's going to give you the instructions that you need. Okay. So to know what you can use to clean the instruments, whether you can use tap water, whether you need to use sterile water, um, if it can withstand detergent, everything is going to be in that instruction to be used. They're going to tell you exactly what you need. So don't throw out that piece of paper. They're important. Now, typically, they can be online. You can usually find uh, the instructions you know, right online on the manufacturer's website. Now, when you're working in decontamination, all these instruments are now coming to your decontamination room. That person receiving these instruments, be sure you're using your universal precautions. This is your personal protective equipment, your PPE. Utility gloves, liquid resistant gown, liquid resistant shoe covers, face mask that's fluid resistant, eye protection, goggles, face shield, your, you know, your flushing cannulas, water is going everywhere. Make sure you're keeping your eyes protected. And you want to keep the aerosols down. So when you're cleaning instruments in a uh, sink, you want to be sure you're washing under the water line. You want you don't want to be up here above the water line and having everything splashing. So make sure you're washing below the water line and keep that lid on the ultrasound if you're using an ultrasound machine. Okay. You've got manual cleaning these instruments. This is you know for instruments to just um, wipe clean using a moistened sponge, an instrument wipe. Um, you can use a soft. Toothbrush, I say soft because be sure that those aren't the uh, those metal bristles that you know they can sometimes use to really really clean. Um, those are very abrasive to ophthalmic instruments, so make sure you're using a soft toothbrush. Um, instruments with lumens need to be flushed with distilled critical water. All critical water is the word critical just means treated. That's your distilled or sterile water. All right, so be sure if you're using tap water per se to clean your instruments, you wanna be sure that the last flush, the last rinse is with critical distilled or sterile water, all right? Tap water is terrible for instruments. So you wanna be sure you're getting all that off. And then it's followed by compressed air, all right? Lumens, you cannot leave water inside a cannula or inside a FACO handpiece or inside any, um, any instrument that has, you know, uh, that's hollow and has a hole in it. 
all you're going to do then is in the next procedure when that surgeon gets that cannula and they're going to you know flush bss in someone's eye you're going to end up with that sterile water or distilled water or even tap water left over and it's going to shoot into somebody else's eye and now you're going to cause an infection so you want to be sure that you're using compressed air to compress everything out and make sure that lumen is as dry as can be you also have mechanical cleaning so with mechanical cleaning, you're using a cleaning agent, okay? This is your detergent. When you're choosing a detergent, you really want to be sure that, it that it's low sudsing. It's not something that's going to foam up. You want low foam. It's biodegradable, easily rinsed off. That's important. Non-abrasive. It can disperse organic oil. That's your blood. And it's non-toxic. So when you're choosing your, your detergent, be sure you're looking at the instructions before you're looking at the... Um, even at the you know, ingredients and make sure that it's telling you that it's not abrasive, it's telling you that it's non-toxic and that it's low foaming. And with detergent, we're gonna talk a little bit about TAS. And I'm sure most of you know what TAS is, is that your toxic anterior segment syndrome. This is a acute, severe intraocular inflammation of the anterior segment after intraocular surgery. Okay. There's a lot of potential causes for it. It could be contaminated BSS, um, intraocular irrigating solutions with an abnormal pH. Uh, these can be your viscoelastic devices. They can be intraocular medications. These are antibiotics um, in the irrigation solution or intracameral antibiotics. These could be your topical ointments, preservatives. Um, but what typically we see in TAS is inadequate flushing of instruments in between cases, which I was just talking about in the previous slide resulting in a buildup of your uh, viscoelastic agent. Okay, it's a, it's a terrible thing to see if anyone has ever experienced a patient um, with TAS. You know, we wanna do everything we can to avoid it. So how do we avoid it? Well, we wanna be sure that we are following our instructions for use. The cleaning solution shouldn't be mixed. It, it should be mixed and not you know, guessed. So when you're putting detergent in your sonic machine or you're putting detergent in your sink, to clean your instruments, don't just pump, pump, and just guess. You're going to end up with way more detergent than you need. Look at the instructions and see what it says. You only need this much for this gallon of water. It says that for a reason. It says that because it's telling you how much you need to make it easily rinsed off um, so that you're still cleaning effectively, but you're going to be able to rinse it off you know, appropriately and not using more than you need. So don't guess. Just measure the amount. What we would do is we take a, med we take a, a medicine cup and we measured exactly the amount that the instructions are telling us to do. And we'd sit it by the um, sonic machine. And then when it was time, that's what we use. We put it in and then get another one ready for the next, next procedure. Rinse, 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 rinse. Instruments need to be thoroughly rinsed with copious amounts of water. Copious, love that word. They say it in so many instructions for use. There really is no exact number for copious. Typically, we like to see about 120 cc's is what well, most people use to flush cannulas um, and then compressed air to follow. But even your instruments themselves, rinse, 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 take the time in between cases to rinse those instruments out. If you're using tap water, please be sure that the instructions for you say that you can use tap water. Again, tap water is not great for instruments. Um, but if you are, no matter what, the final rinse really should be um, done with distilled, sterile, or treated water. This is just an example when we talk about instructions for use. I took this off of, you know, online, off of a, a FACO hand piece. And this is really the company telling us this is what you need to do to clean that FACO hand piece. And actually, you can see in the middle there, push a minimum of 120 cc's of room temperature, sterile, deionized water through both the irrigation and aspiration tasks. It's telling us this is what we need to do to clean this instrument. And then using the same syringe, flush both ports with a minimum of 60 cc's of air. So this is just gives you an idea of what instructions for use may look like. But this is the company telling you what you need to do to properly clean your instruments. When you're using a sonic machine or you're cleaning your instruments in the sink, let's say, just make sure your, your warm water, it's, your water doesn't exceed 60 degrees Celsius. It should be warm water, not, you know, not hot, hot, hot water. So you're going to ruin your instruments if it's too hot. When you're cleaning your instruments, make sure those instruments that come apart or have hinges that you take them apart. 
needle holders, forceps, scissors, they have to be completely open so that you can get inside those jaws and expose all those parts to not only the decontamination process where you're cleaning them, but also the sterilant when you sterilize it. Steam has to get in. That's how steam works to penetrate. Completely open or disassemble these parts. The example below is, you know, that um, holder that we typically use for our, let's say, 57 blades or 67 blades. There's a little piece at the end. That's just a screw. That's all that is. You got to take that screw out. That that unless the instrument came that way, fused together, most instruments, when you're going to get them, you're going to see they come they come in pieces. If they come in pieces and you have to put those pieces together, then you have to take those pieces out when you clean and sterilize them. So basically, if it wasn't manufactured that way, it doesn't get sterilized that way. You got to take that screw out. You got to take apart that caulk needle holder. You got to pull apart those scissors. You want to clean inside really well, especially scissors, but you also want to be sure that your sterilizing agent is going to be able to penetrate. Let me do it on time. Good. No lumens and detergent. Okay. Um, it's, it's such a risk for tasks. Still want to be flushing your instruments. Still want to be doing your compressed air, but try not to put them, try not to put lumens in detergent. You can use lubricants for your hinged instruments. This is going to help these hinged instruments open and close properly. There's nothing worse than handing an instrument to a surgeon and, and it's scissors that don't open. So lubricants needed for just, just for hinged instruments. Um, these are your scissors, your needle holders, even forceps. And it's going to prevent, you know, um, stiff joints. And it's also going to help inhibit corrosion. Usually the instruments, of course, look at the IFU, but usually instruments are dipped. It's one by one in a lubricant. It's not usually soaked. Um, you want to be sure you're not using lubricant in um, cannulas. But you, we spend a lot of money on instruments. Um, so we want to be sure that we're, you know, we're taking good care of them, um, that instruments are working properly. So lubricants is a wonderful way, wonderful way to do that. And just make sure after you know your instruments are done and whether you're storing them, um, you just don't you want to be sure you're not putting them away wet. And that is an actual instrument on the left hand side that's found in a tray, I'm sure, um, or in a drawer somewhere. And look at that rust. I mean, you wouldn't want to give this instrument to a surgeon to use on a patient. Okay, this is rust that happens when instruments don't don't you know uh, dry. Um, if they put away wet or damp, they're going to rust out. So be sure that you're, you know, drying your instruments and that you're not keeping instruments that that look like that picture. Let's talk a little bit about stains, because I know some of us will see, you know, some instruments come through that may have different stains or rust or pitting. Just so you know what it means when you see that. Um, the difference really is stain is a discoloration on an instrument surface. Rust can be a red or orange coloration on the surface of the instrument that results in oxidation. And then you got pitting. So pitting is an erosion. It, it's an instrument's outer surface where you're gonna see that pitting on, the, on those instruments. Typically, um, that means that an instrument's done beyond repair. You can't use an instrument with pitting. Um, these can be small, tiny dots, or they could even be a large hole. Once you start seeing pitting, you gotta throw it away. If you got a brown orange color, that could be rust. Um, it could be due to your water quality. It can be due to um, saline. Um, if you get a dark brown, black color, that can be dry blood. Um, anything high acidic detergent can cause that. Make sure you're using a neutral pH um, in your detergents, and the detergents will, will tell you what the pH is. Blue-gray, cold sterilization solutions. So just make sure you're using your manufacturer's instructions. And light and dark spots, these can be water spots from not drying very well, which can lead to rust. If you're getting just stains, um, you can use a non-abrasive cleaner. You can use a commercial stain remover. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, an eraser. If it's just a simple stain, you could even use an eraser to, to get that stain out. It works actually very, very well. Now, if you're more than 5% of your instruments are getting stained, that's something you should look into. That's something that you could do a quality insurance study to determine what is causing those stains. So if you're getting a lot of them, do a good investigation to see what's happening. All right. Sterilization, we're going to get into the nitty gritty. So I try to focus mostly on the sterilization process we see in ophthalmology, and that's typically um, chemical or heating. Chemical could be liquid or gas, so it could be either glutaraldehyde or ethylene oxide. And heating, most of us are familiar with moist heat and steam sterilization. Some people ask which is better. Neither one of them, none of them are better than the other. It's what's more appropriate. 
for what you're trying to sterilize, okay? So when you're using chemical sterilization, this is your liquid or gas, even though steam sterilization provides the most, you know, reliable way to get rid of objects and, um, uh, you know, transmittable agents, it's not always the best sterilization process because it's not always appropriate. Heating can cause damage to electronics, uh, certain plastics can melt, even fiber optics. So you just want to make sure, you know, you're using the right sterilization process. And then you've got liquid sterilants. These are, um, this is your glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde works as a high level disinfectant and a sterilizing agent. It does this by completely immersing items in the solution for an extended period of time. The advantages to something like glutaraldehyde is it's, if you're not using um, sterilization often, it's an inexpensive option. And it's safe for lensed instruments. I do know a facility that's used it on their, um, you know, on their uh, 20 diopter lenses, per, let's say. So, you know, if you're not using it often, it can take a long time. Um, and it's very inexpensive and you can use it, you know, very safely on lensed instruments. But the same with glutaraldehyde, it is a toxic material. The same properties that make it a good sterilizing agent can also make it harmful to you and I. It can release toxic fumes, um, that those fumes have a really pungent odor that can be irritating. There's really no reliable method of monitoring the sterilization process. You can't put a bug test in there or a, you know, or a sterilization strip. Um, there's potential for contamination during rinsing and transferring, and any residual solution can be extremely toxic to intraocular and extraocular tissue. You can be a good sterilizing agent, but just to give you the warning that it is toxic. Then you got your gas. So gas is, this is your ethyl oxide, ethylene oxide, an organic chemical and a member of the ether group. And EO depends on four factors when you're doing gas sterilization. You've got the gas concentration, temperature, humidity, and time, these four factors. So a typical gas sterilization procedure consists of a preconditioning phase, a sterilization phase, a post-sterilization, and then aeration. Now, way back when, machines weren't, um, machines weren't, didn't have an aeration process, okay? They weren't developed like that. Once the sterilization process was done, we would take them out when it says it was time to, and then we'd have to sit the instruments on a shelf to aerate for a certain period of time, whether I think from what I remember it was 24 hours, because the old machines didn't have an aeration um, process. Now they do. All the newer gas machines have um, aeration as part of the process. So it's no longer, you know, long, no longer having to sit out. Um, typically they have different process times for things like long tubings, because those things will take longer to dry. So you'll see that, you know, sometimes the process will be longer if you're using things like tubing. So it gives it that time to, to air out. The advantages to gas is it's very compatible with packing material. Okay. So it can put, prolong how long you keep your instruments and, in, in, you know, in packages on the, on the shelf. It completely permeates porous material and it's non-corrosive, corrosive. so it's, it's good for the instruments. But it's also expensive. The gas ampules, the, um, you know, the, all the different things you need to run a gas sterilization process can be very expensive. Um, the cycles themselves are expensive to run. It does require aeration, like mentioned. It is a gas. It is, can be harmful to the operator. Um, it is carcinogenic, mutagenic, and it can be a very long and slow process. Now, gas in its pure form can also be extremely flammable. So you just got to remember where you, you know, where you're storing it. With all of this, I will share, I've been doing gas sterilization for, oh my gosh, it's got to be 20, 25 years now. Never seen a problem. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a very good uh, sterilization process. If you, you know, follow the rules, follow the instructions. I think the only time I've ever seen an issue with gas sterilization, typically it has to get um, aerated out. There's usually a, um, it gets, um, you know, usually there's like a pipe through the wall of some sort. And I, I think at one point there was like a bird's nest up at the top with a, you know, um, where it goes outside. And that was, you know, that was inhibiting it from uh, releasing, you know, releasing the agents. So I think that's in 25 years, the only problem I've ever seen with gas sterilization. So it really is a great process, but it is expensive to run. You need um, obviously the gas, you need um, humidity, humidity chips. You need to put a bug test in every one. You need to put a dosimeter in every one. So it's not just throwing instruments into a, a you know, a, a box, so to speak, and sterilizing with gas. There's, there's a lot of different 
items that you need to put in there as well, and they can be expensive. Now we got what all of us are used to, and, and one of the most common um, means for sterilizing is saturated steam under pressure. This is how steam sterilizes. Um, steam sterilization is the oldest, cheapest, and best understood method of sterilization, and it works like a pressure cooker. All right, moist heat kills microorganisms by causing a coagulation of proteins. Now, the vibration of every molecule of a microorganism causes the splitting of the hydrogen bonds between the proteins. And then death of that microorganism is caused by irreversible damage to all of the metabolic function of that organism. That's how steam works. It's like a pressure cooker. So moist heat versus dry heat. Steam, look at it this way. Steam coagulates microorganism cell protein similar to poaching an egg in boiling water. All right, if you're going to throw it, you know, uh, crack open an egg in boiling water, that egg white is going to coagulate when you poach it. You're putting it in boiling water at 100 degrees Celsius. If you're frying an egg using dry heat, that requires 371 degrees Celsius and can take longer. So there's your correlation between moist heat and dry heat. Boiling water, 100 degrees. Frying an egg, 371, and it takes a lot longer. So basically, the more moisture that's present, the more heat can be carried. Steam is, you know, is an effective carrier of heat. So another way to think about it, when you cook beef at home, you just throw it in the oven. It can be really tough when it's roasted in a covered pan. Now, if you add a little water to the bottom of the pan, the meat now will become tender. The temperature is the same. The time of the roasting is the same. But the results are different because you added water. Now add pressure. By putting the same roast in a pressure cooker and reducing, it reduces the cooking time by at least three quarters, and you still get a ton of product. So here you're adding moisture and you're adding pressure. So we talked a little bit in the beginning about pre vacuum and gravity displacement. So these are your two types of sterilization processes when you're working with steam. So let's first talk about gravity displacement. Uh, many of the tabletop sterilizers out there, I believe, um, they run by gravity displacement. How that works is steam is pumped into the chamber that contains that ambient air. Now steam is less dense than air, so it rises to the top of the chamber and eventually pushes all that air out. It displaces all that air. The steam fills the chamber, displaces all that residual air that's forced out through a drain, typically through the typically you'll see it in the bottom of the sterilizer. And by pushing that air out, and it's, you're pushing it and it's gonna go through that hole, um, by pushing all that air out, the steam is able to directly contact the load and begin to sterilize. So you have steam pumped in, steam rises. It's going to push. The, now it's rising. And it's going to push all that air out through a, um, you know, through a drain, and then that steam is going to contact that load. That's typically gravity displacement. But then you get vacuum, pre-vac is what we typically call it. It's really a more efficient form, and it's great for porous loads. I'll tell you why. It's a vacuum system. So it starts with a series of alternating steam pressure injections and these little vacuum draws, these are little pulses. And what it does is it, these pulses dynamically remove the air from the chamber. So this allows the steam to be sucked into little areas that otherwise would have difficulty penetrating like um, cannulas, things with you know, small holes and lumens. The absence of air within the chamber allows that steam to immediately penetrate that load. And that allows for much more reliable, more efficient form of sterilization with shorter sterilization times. So you have a vacuum system, you have the, these little pulses that dynamically remove the air, and then that allows the steam to penetrate the load. So typically, um, you know, with steam sterilization, we do like to see a vacuum cycle because it's really a, a more efficient cycle um, and it's great for porous loads. So if you're using cannulas and, and you know things with small lumens, it's a much better uh, sterilization process. Now, we have immediate use sterilization, IUSS, if, if you are familiar with that term. IUSS really should only be used in critical situations where there is not sufficient time to process instruments through terminal sterilization. And this is usually through gravity displacement. Now, if you do want to use IUSS, typically it's a shorter cycle. It doesn't have a very long dry cycle. Sometimes it doesn't have a dry cycle at all, um, which we're going to get into later. But with IUSS, it's typically a shorter cycle. But even though, it still must be processed in the same manner. In other words, your instruments will have to be clean and decontaminated. It needs to be placed in a container that's intended for the cycle parameters, gravity displacement. 
It needs to be used immediately. It cannot be stored for later use. That's the big piece of this. Immediate use sterilization is instruments that are not stored. You can't use IUSS, gravity displacement, and then you know, try to store it later, all right? Especially if the instruments are coming out wet. Should not be used for purposes of convenience, like lack of adequate supplies of instruments to meet surgical volume. In other words, you know, you you got too many cases to be doing, you know, uh, pre-vac and long sterilization cycles, and you're going to use IUSS to, you know, shorten that cycle. That's a no. They must be compatible with the instruments IFU, and really, you should be documenting. If you're using IUSS, just drop, you know, document it. Uh, the instrument dropped on the floor. The surgeon, the only one we have, surgeon really needed it. Okay. One instrument didn't have a hole or a lumen, you know, you, uh, you dropped a hook or you dropped a second instrument, you're going to put it in sterilizer using IUSS. That's okay. That's okay to do that. Um, you're doing it um, appropriately, but you really should be documenting it. Okay. Let's talk about those uh, wet instruments a little bit. So when you have instruments coming out wet, there's different reasons for that. It's not great when instruments are coming out wet. Your instruments really should not be coming out wet. Your packages should not be coming out wet. All right. Um, usually when you find that packages and loads and trays are coming out with moisture in them, you, you need to be redoing that, redoing that cycle. What can cause wet, you know, wet um, packages, wrapping material, if you're using reusable linen, um, usually it's the cotton thread can cause condensation on the wrapping material. If you're loading these packages too tightly, that can cause condensation to be trapped, steam to be trapped inside, in between. So you gotta leave space in between the sets. Peel pouches, don't stack them one on top of the other. You should be using some type of rack to have them vertically placed. Otherwise, when they're shoved all in together, there's steam penetration, that can't happen, and now you've got condensation happening. If you're doing a mixed load, just make sure that the upper shelf is for the linen and the bottom shelf is for metal. All right, that way, if you know, typically sometimes the metal is what can cause um, con so typically if you're getting condensation, the metal is going to drop on your linen. It's going to soak your, you know, your linen packages. If you're using wrap packages and those packages are wrapped, I'm sorry, if you're using peel pouches and those pouches are really wet when they're coming out. That is a big source of those peel pouches to get penetrated and to contaminate what's inside, all right? Dry time, improper dry time, or interrupt, you should never interrupt the dry cycle, okay? Selecting a drying time that doesn't meet the instructions for use. Removing packs from the autoclave too early, that can cause condensation. These are all things that can cause, you know, packages to, to be wet. Remember, the process of sterilization packaging is to keep sterilized instruments away from the external environment. So when packs are wet, moisture acts as a pathway for that microorganism, and that's a high risk of contamination if moisture can get inside the pack. Inst in, or instrument sets. Instrument sets should not be coming out soaked and wet. Instrument sets containing moisture inside the container, consider those contaminated. Really shouldn't be used and you really should be doing them. Moisture can cause potentially contaminated instruments, increased risk of infection, which then can result in poor patient outcomes. Okay. Don't bring cardboard or correlated boxes to sterile areas of your operating theater. Okay, if you're getting those instruments that are coming in in boxes and all of your supplies, don't bring cardboard boxes into sterile areas. All right. When you get instruments that come in, First thing you want to do is look at these instruments. Okay, and this is all under infection control. Make sure that they're properly aligned, make sure scissors open properly, make sure there's no corrosion. You always want to manually inspect these instruments upon delivery. But most importantly, do not take them out of their boxes and put them into the sterilizer. They need to be washed, cleaned, manually cleaned, however the instructions for use tell you. Speaking with a good friend of mine this past weekend, she was at a surgery center that was having a, uh, unfortunately, a span of infection. They come to find out they were, they just got new instruments and they were taking their brand new instruments right out of the box that were just delivered and putting them right into the sterilizer. There's your source of infection. They weren't clean. Who knows what those instruments have on them coming from the facilities, okay? So be sure that you are cleaning and, you know, um, these instruments well, you know, really well before you 
put them into the sterilizer. The reason why you can't bring cardboard boxes to a sterile area is because when you get these shipments that come in these boxes, there can be bugs in them. I've actually seen it. Um, taking out all the stuff that was in a corrugated box all the way to the bottom was a nice spider sitting on the bottom there. I've seen silverfish in there. I've seen it all. Um, so you have to be sure that you're not bringing cardboard boxes to a sterile area just for that risk of something could possibly be in that box. There's accountability, everyone. Make sure at the end of a sterilization cycle, the operator needs to verify that the correct parameters were met before those items are used. That's where your um, mechanical monitoring comes in place, your printouts, your monitors, your gauges. Initial the printout. Or do you have a logbook with the cycle information, the person who removed it? Something that you can track. You really should be able to go back and track every process. If a patient does get an infection, you should be able to go back and say, okay, their instruments came out of sterilizer A, um, you know, um, at whatever time, and this, this person took the instruments out. Did this person check that the parameters were met? Where is that printout? Can we see that everything, you know, was sterilized according to the correct parameters? Accountability and also a way to be able to go back and track. There's also what's called um, third party testing. So, really, you could take a logbook, I hate to say it, but it's true. You could take a logbook and just write down all the way down, yes, 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 I checked everything, everything's fine. Who's saying someone actually did that? It's sad, but it's true and it can happen. But if you're using a third party testing, you have a person on the outside telling you whether or not your machines are working, okay, that third party. Basically what they do is they give you a score strip and a control strip. They have you sterilize it, they have you write down on a piece of paper all the parameters. You know, I sterilized at 270 degrees for this amount of time and pressure. It was sent to an outside company for testing. The results are returned and tells you whether or not it passed. Okay, this is a great way to validate that everything's working well. Some people, I've seen some centers do this once a month. I see some centers do it quarterly, once a year, twice a year. It's just a really good validation to be sure that everything's working properly. How do you know your ultrasonic machine's working properly? We're, we've talked about sterilizers and everything working well, but how do you know your ultrasonic machine's working properly? Through cavitation testing. There's so very many different ways to do cavitation testing. I can't you know, tell you if there's one better than the other. This is just an example of many of them. All cavitation is, is that rapid creation and destruction of vacuum bubbles or these little cavities within a liquid. So these microscopic bubbles, when they're forced into contact with a solid surface, they collapse. and the surrounding liquid fills the area of the bubble once occupied, and that creates that intense scrubbing um, action. And the cleaning solution then rushes against the object to be clean. They sell commercial products for cavitation testing. On the left is just one example. I've seen people use what's called a frosted glass test, in that you know when you put that glass inside of a sonic machine, it's going to come out. You're going to see that that frosted glass is this, um, you know, it's been. Uh, lines and spots and it's, it's, you couldn't be able to see on it that, you know, that uh, cavitation and um, those bubbles and everything, you know, hit that frosted glass is going to change, you know, how that frosted glass looks. You can also use a foil test. I've heard of people doing this as well. You see all those little holes in the foil that telling you that, you know, the machine is working properly and cavitation is working. The only thing to remember with a foil test is that, you know, once it pokes the holes through that foil, now you've got little pieces of foil inside of your um, sonic machine, which could accidentally get inside of an instrument set. So if you are, you're using a full test, just keep that in mind. Sterile storage. Shelf life of a sterile package is determined by the date, the integrity of the package, the size of the package, or if you've got policies and procedures. Typically with sterile storage, packages are good for as long as they're not compromised. Okay, it used to be, oh, I remember when we started, we used to re redo all our packages every six months. That those days you don't do that much anymore, unless your policies and procedures tell you to do that. If your facility feels as though you should, then you're following your policy and procedures. Just understand that instruments stay wrapped, wrapped instruments stay sterile as long as that wrap stays intact, the integrity of that package. Now wrapped instruments, wrapped packages can be pill pouches, rigid containers, wrappers, you just want to be 100% sure that the sterilizer and the instruments and the container that they're in are all compatible. Okay, IFUs, look at your manufacturer's instructions. All of those three have to match. 
You want to be sure that you're selecting packaging validated for the sterilization process and the cycle parameters. And I'm going to give you a good example as to why. Using a rigid container, the instrument hit the floor. It was an instrument that the rep had brought in. It was the only one they had, really needed to use it, had no other. So they needed to stick it in under immediate use sterilization, which is perfectly fine. Cleaned it, put it in a rigid container, put it through IUSS, which is gravity displacement. Got it back pretty quickly. Got it into the star, got it into the operating room. The outside class one was fine, changed color because it went through a process. Open up the container, open up the sterilized, open up the tray inside of it. And the class five inside did not change. It went through it went through a sterilization process, but the color didn't change. The reason why is because that rigid container was not validated for gravity displacement. Steam didn't penetrate all the way through the container. Now at this point, I've got instruments on my back table that are not sterile. So not only did we unfortunately, you know, um, drop the instrument and have to take the time to sterilize it again. Now we're gonna take the whole back table apart. Everything, everything's gone because I had unsterile, an unsterile instrument on my back table. So that shows you that you have to be sure you're choosing the right sterilization parameters, your pre-vac, your gravity that matches the instrument, it matches the, the container. Everything has to match in order to be sure that your instruments are getting properly sterilized. Peel pouches, I think we've all seen them. These are lightweight, small. They're, made, they're meant for lightweight and small instruments. You want to be sure you're not throwing as much as you possibly can. If you're, let's just say you're sterilizing um, cautery cords and you've got a pretty big cautery cord, a thick cautery cord, you want to make sure you're using the right size pouch. You're going to allow for steam penetration. Um, make sure you're using tip protectors, okay, to protect those tips so they're not poking through and causing contamination. These are the rigid containers I was just talking about. Um, they can be used as a way of packaging surgical instruments for future use. Some of them, once they're inside that container, if they get locked and you can put that on the shelf for as many months as the instrument, as the manufacturer's use tells you. So I've seen some of them good for up to 360 days, as long as that container you know, stays um, intact and not compromised. Then you got your wrappers. These are used, you know, for package, you know, instrument trays, double wrap to provide the best barrier. Don't do it too tight. Indicated tape to secure the wrapper. Just remember a lot of those indicated tapes can be uh, latex based. Make sure you're labeling everything. You should be labeling what sterilizer you use. If you only have one, that's fine. If you've got two or three, make sure you're, you know, whether it's sterilizer A, B, C, one, two, three, it doesn't matter. Make sure you put down the cycle of load number, the date of the sterilization, description of the contents and your initials. Again, accountability and also tracking. So labeling these packages, um, believe it or not, there is a pen out there that's specifically designed, um, may not have been designed for this particular reason, but it is designed properly um, to be able to use in sterilization. It doesn't, uh, it's not, it's waterproof. It doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't, uh, drip or um, it's non-toxic. This is a Sharpie. So it's a Sharpie 13601. It's black ink. It's beautiful for being able to write on packages. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's just a great Sharpie to be able to use so that things don't, you know, run. Um, it's non-toxic. It's heat resistant. So keep that in mind, Sharpie 13601. And now you have storage. So the shelf life of a package, as I had mentioned, is event related. Okay. No longer do you have to you know, take everything out of a package and re-sterilize them after a certain amount of time. The shelf life depends on the quality and integrity of the package, the storage conditions, the amount of handling. When you go to pull a package off the shelf, is it yellow? Is it all crunched up? Then you don't want to use it. Um, you know, uh, does the package look perfectly fine? It hasn't been no holes in them. The integrity looks good. Then it's fine, even if it was sterilized six months ago. You know, what really matters is that event related. Were there any events that happened that would um, compromise the integrity of that package? Just make sure that you're, you're looking at the package well before you go and put it on your scrubs back table. And also make sure that you're looking at your quality control. Whatever you're using to be sure that the instruments inside is sterile, usually it's a chemical indicator. 
hopefully a class five or, you know, something to make sure it penetrates. Some of packages have um, indicators inside that they come with the manufacturer by that, by that way through the manufacturer. Just make sure if you're the circulator opening that package, you're not just taking and opening it. You're looking to be sure that it, it passed everything it needed to pass so that the instruments are sterile. Don't use elastic bands to secure them. Don't crunch or bend or compress instruments. Um, uh, pouches and wrappers. Don't stack wrapped items. Okay, stacking results in you know undue pressure from all that weight and can compromise it. Don't store items on the floor or window sills where water could get in or any other area than just a designated shelf. Make sure you're using your tip covers. These are just all examples of what you could possibly use. Just make sure when you're using tip covers, you see those holes in them. That's really important. Steam has to penetrate. If they don't have holes, you have very little area for steam penetration just from where the instrument went in. That's not enough. You need those holes for steam penetration. And when you're loading a tray to be sterilized, please, like I mentioned, leave room for steam penetration. Leave room so you don't get um, condensation. All those instruments shoved in there like that, that's not good. You're not allowing steam penetration to get through these packages, so make sure you know, these trays have these little spots for a reason to lay your instruments exactly how they need to be with a little bit of room in between them. Um, sometimes I think some people go by like an inch in between each one to give it room um, for steam penetration. In your instrument tray, make sure you're leaving a gap in between your instruments, okay, for that steam penetration and to, you know, is, let that moisture escape. Don't load instruments on top of each other. If you're putting an instrument in those little, um, rubber mats, just make sure you're not putting multiple instruments on top of each other. If you're using a multi-layer tray, be sure it's be, it's used as the manufacturer designed it. In other words, don't improvise and try to use your own um, way of doing double layers. In other words, you have one layer, now you're going to put, you know, a, a sterile towel or a sterile something on top, and then you're going to put instruments on top of that, and you all of a sudden you're layered um, in a way that the manufacturer did not intend for that tray, all right? Make sure that it's designed specifically that you have multiple multiple layers. Face all the instruments in the same direction, that's for safety. Shop instruments should face outward, not towards you. So when you're setting up your instrument tray, don't face anything shot towards you. Um, try to use a separate tray for um, your shops or a designated area of the tray for your shops. So the person who's cleaning them, um, it just it's another sense of protection, okay? So they know where your shops are. Um, either make a little spot on the side or you can use a separate tray. And only reuse, re-sterilize instruments where the IFU says you can reuse it. The IFU says one, one use only, it's one use only. Okay, so just be sure that you're only reusing things that the IFU says to. When you're returning things to the sterile field, be sure they're transported with protection. Okay, these are our covered containers. All right. Um, you can't, you really sh can't, shouldn't take instruments out of sterilize in an open tray walking them through, bring them into an operating room, so many chances of contamination. Make sure that they're transported the way that prevents contamination like a covered container. And when you're on your way out, bring in anything that's dirty. All instruments that were on the sterile field, remember whether they were used or not, are considered contaminated even if they weren't used on the patient. The containment should be achieved using some type of container that's been identified to prevent the staff from coming in contact with an instrument. Um, to you know something like a, a red sticker or something you can see here biohazard. The container must be leak proof, puncture proof, marked with a biohazard label. Examples can be closed cots, bins with a lid, impermeable bags. You can use a rigid container system. Just make sure the IFU is says that you can use it for bringing dirty instruments out as sort of a container. That right there is a just a regular plastic uh, rubber made bin, I think it is. And that's fine, okay? It, it has a biohazard label, it's leak proof, it's puncture proof. We marked it with a biohazard label. There you go. Just make sure, you know, you're cleaning it obviously well, but this is something that you could, you know, you can use um, and it really meets all of the specifications. Make sure you get proper education, everyone. It's no longer see one, do one, teach one when it comes to sterilization, okay? Um, really be sure that your staff is getting the proper education. Don't let anyone touch a sterilizer unless they know and they've been properly trained. 
receive adequate training and make sure that their skills are verified, competency verification, continuing education and in-service training on any new instruments, any new devices or any new equipment, all right? Be sure, be sure that you have the right education. And that my friends is the end of the talk. And I see some in the question on the Q&A. So let's see what we can do here. Okay, so the Bowie Dick test. I can I can certainly explain a Bowie Dick test. The Bowie Dick test is just a test used on sterilizers that use the pre-vac cycle. Okay, not gravity displacement. So when you're using a pre-vac cycle, when I mentioned that the pulses, those dynamic pulses, um, those vacuums that are used, what a Bowie Dick test is, it tests tests that function. All right, it's not telling you that something that the sterilizers sterilizing and it's not like a bug test all a bowie dick test is doing is it's testing the function of a pre-vac sterilizer is it proper to rent instruments with 100 degrees you want to use the instrument the in manufacturer's use look at the look it up online look it up in the packaging that may have come with that instrument every instrument's different so to say that you can use 100 degrees Celsius, I can't tell you that because I don't know what the instrument's um, instructions for use are. Some instruments may be able to withstand heat better than others. So to really know the water, um, if you're cleaning them, you really should look at your manufacturers for use. If you're using the sonic machine, however, just be sure it's not too hot. I think I said 140 degrees um, Fahrenheit is what I believe it said. Um, typically, you don't want to go hotter than that in a sonic machine, but what you're using for water, you do want to be sure the temperature matches the IFU, the instructions for use, which is most commonly used lubricant. There's so many out there. I really couldn't say um, a commonly used one. There are very, very many out there. You want to just use the ones that are right for your instruments. You know, we're using small micro instruments, um, hinges scissors, uh, needle holders. So just take a look at what's out there and see what you think is, is you know, um, most proper for our instruments. Would it be wise to cover instruments with a sterilized towel? Can you go back, um, Andy, to that last question? Oh, wait, maybe I can do it here. Hold on. I saw one about a sterilized towel. Um, I'm not sure what that meant, but if you're Covering instruments with a towel depends on what your, you know, if you're bringing instruments out of the sterilizer, excuse me, out of the operating room, bringing them to decontamination, just covering them with a towel is really not adequate. You want to be 100% sure that those instruments are in a covered container, it's leak proof, um, and it's puncture proof. So a towel really wouldn't help. Um, now, if you're bringing instruments out and you don't have time at the moment to clean them, even though you really should be cleaning them right away. You just don't have that time. A wet towel sometimes is used to keep them moist. I have seen that. Let's see what else we got here. Is it okay to wash instruments through the clean water to soap water, then clean water, then chlorine water, then clean water afterwards? Clean water to soapy chlorine and clean. It really depends on the IFU of the instruments. Um, I'm not sure about the chlorine water. I've never really seen that. You just want to be sure at the end that you are rinsing your instruments with critical water. That, that should be your last phase. Okay, so you're cleaning water using detergent. Um, just be sure that your last rinse cycle is sterile or, um, you know, or treated water um, and it's not like tap water. Which sterilizer is better for heat sensitive instruments? ETO or plasma, either. Um, it really just depends on um, you know the instrument itself and what the IFU says. Um, ETO is a great um, it's a great sterilization method for heat sensitive instruments. Uh, I don't work with plasma with plasma. I I do know the process, but I I can't speak to it. I'm not you know I I've never really used it, um, but I can tell you that ETO is a, a very good process for heat sensitive. But check the IFUs and check and see what the instructions for you say. Um, in terms of what you can use for sterilization. Drum, can you please tell me what autoclave drum cleaning material? That's going to be, the, okay, cleaning the drum of a sterilizer. I'm assuming you mean the um, chamber of where you're keeping the water. So that's a very good topic, and that's a very interesting topic. Many of these tabletop sterilizers are very difficult to clean the drum. Um, they Some of them do have tubes that come out of the chamber and allows you to drain it. But even as you are draining it, 
you, it's, you're still going to find moisture within those, within those chambers. They typically don't drain properly all the way, you know, 100%. It's, there's always, you know, moisture you're going to see on the bottom of some of these um, drums. And that moisture can cause, cause problems. You can get bugs that can grow in there. Um, it is really hard to, to properly um, completely drain some of these chambers. Um, I have actually, and I'm not by any means um, saying this is correct. I'm actually using it in a negative term. I have seen some scrubs actually pick up and like literally try to dump, um, you know, table stop terrorizers, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. It's going to hurt, you know, hurt you or anyone. Um, so it's really, you got to be careful, but I wish I had a, a good way to tell you how best to clean them. Um, check your manufacturers for use and see what they stay. But I do understand that they can be very difficult to get all the to get all the water out. Um, I can't really recommend a good autoclave machine. I apologize. I really, um, you know, I they they all work in different ways. They all have a different means of working. Um, so it really just depends on your facility, um, what you're, you know, what you're sterilizing, how big your trays are, um, what your case volume is, things like that. So I, it's hard to say, you know, one sterilizer over another one. Do we need to have the autoclave machine um, clean done periodically? Yes, you should be doing um, testing of your autoclave. We call this, um, you know, preventative preventative maintenance. So your autoclave should be um, going through preventative maintenance, whether you know whatever your policies and procedures are um, that say you need to have somebody come in, take it apart, make sure everything's working properly at least once a year. At least um, many facilities many facilities do this twice a year, but you should be going through um, preventative maintenance for your machines. Placing instruments in the tray should just be face up or down away from you. So when you're putting instruments inside of a tray, making sure that all of the tips are facing outward to the top of the tray, so to speak, and not facing this way. And that's just for safety purposes, because me as a scrub, if I'm going to grab something, I don't want to hit a shock that could be facing me. So everything's faced outward. Best lubricants, I again, you know, it's hard to say I wouldn't be able to recommend one or the other. If instruments are sterilized, appeared and put on the table in OT for surgery, and if for some reason surgery postponed for two to four hours, can we use those sterilized instruments? Okay, so this is a little controversial. So typically when instruments are sitting there for a long period of time, what happens is you're probably going to break scrub and you're going to leave. Um, if there's no patient in the room, you've set everything up and the surgery has been postponed. You're going to break scrub. Now you're leaving instruments on the table and everybody's left the room. You have no means of knowing if those instruments have been compromised. So typically what most people will do will put a sign in the door that says do not enter. Um, I've seen some people even put tape over the door. The biggest thing, there really is no time frame unless your facility has a policy procedure saying after an hour, but there's really nothing to validate that. The key to leaving instruments sterile is A, they're sitting there being exposed to the air that's in there. Once well, it's an operating room, of course, and, and you've got good, you should have the quality air, but still the instruments are just sitting there. Um, you have no way to validate if those instruments have been, you know, compromised because you're not even in the room. So there's really no time limit per se that I know of. It could really be your policies and procedures. The biggest thing with instruments sitting in the room is that you don't have any way to know if you break scrub and leave unless you literally sit there for the next two hours and stare at them that, you know, those instruments haven't been compromised. We have surgeries that can go two to four hours and you've got instruments, you know, obviously exposed. So it's not so much that, it's a matter of the instruments being, you know, being compromised. Um, what could have possibly, you know, um, come in contact with those instruments if you're not there looking at them? I can probably take a few more questions. Um, let's see. What do you say about sterilization of ophthalmic instruments morning of surgery only? I'm, I'm afraid I'm not quite sure what that means. How do you package linens? Um, that's going to be, you know, of course, there's a, there is a method to doing, you know, wrapped and packaged items. There is a very specific um, way to do that. Um, I can't recommend a specific detergent for cleaning. Unfortunately, that's something you'll have to look for and see what's best for your facility. Just make sure you're following all of those, you know, recommendations of it being low sudsing, non-toxic, that type of thing. Um, but whether to say one or the other, I really can't. Um, how often can you use lubricant milk? As often as you like. You know, um, it's wonderful for the instruments. Lubricant keeps them, you know, 
um, once a week if you want. Uh, once a month, you can take your instruments and use them. As long as you're using them um, periodically, I think it's great for the instruments. Do you have a separate sterilization room for atomic instruments and central sterilization, such as specialized technicians? So if you're in a facility that uses both ophthalmic instruments and other instruments, other subspecialties, usually it's not a separate room, um, but typically they try not to clean them. You know, let's say, say you're not going to put ophthalmic gentle little micro instruments in a sonic machine with these bigger instruments. You're going to, you know, you don't want to ruin them. Um, typically, they like to keep ophthalmic instruments separate. So when you are caring for ophthalmic instruments, typically you want to be sure that you're keeping them separate from other bigger instruments that could possibly ruin them. And I think that is all of our answers, all of our uh, question and answers. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day or a wonderful evening.